So, hey, I had a conversation with the president the other day, and the topic of how to keep a heart of unity came up while disagreeing. And so I thought I'd just show you a short clip on what that looked like, that conversation, and his very sound advice on what it means to have a heart of unity when you disagree. Point your eyes to the screen. How to disagree with people. Not that you need any help. There's lots of stuff to disagree on if you're looking for it. Cake versus pie, apples or oranges, this sports team versus this sports team, which movie stars better, Ryan Goose Baby or Charming Tater? I don't know. Some people even argue for tree. You just standing there, huh? Listen, listen, Pink. I got an opinion. Who am I to judge, though? Maybe that tree says something about his mama. I'm just saying, some people just get worked up about anything. Even One Direction, you're not all going the same direction anymore. Bye-bye, Zane. Everyone loved you. You broke everyone's heart. Bye-bye. <laughs> Some people argue about which animal is better. Cat, dog, elephant, or donkey. Anyway. <laughs> okay, okay. You're not always going to agree. Even with the most agreeable person in the world. Just saying. Just saying. So look, in a world with so many things to disagree on, we gotta learn how to disagree without making everybody feel terrible. Step one, treat people like they're people, people. I know, seems pretty simple. But in a heated argument, you can forget that you're talking to a person, a human being, someone who has a heartbeat. Unless you're arguing with a tree, um, that's, that's a whole other problem. I can't help you there. Step two, listen, listen, listen. Listen, before trying to change someone's opinion, take time to listen to them, even if what they say does not make sense. That's the power of treating someone like a person. You gotta hear them out. You got two ears and one nose for a reason. You gotta listen more than you smell. I'm pretty sure that's not right. Keep listening. Step three, pause, breathe, love. When you disagree, you're gonna want to do some crazy stuff, like yell, or write and release a whole entire album outlining that you're right and they're wrong. Don't do it. Instead, you gotta pause, breathe, love. It's okay to disagree. It's not okay to be mean. Don't say it until you can say it with love. There's plenty of legit stuff to be mad at in the world. This life stuff, it's hard. Let's not just spend our time here being mad at each other. You don't have to see eye to eye to work shoulder to shoulder, people. <laughs> Well, obviously that was not our current president, but Robbie Novak, who plays the kid president, and I love those videos. But I thought in light of this past week, we might want to have a conversation, a real conversation, as we continue our series on United about the topic of how to keep a heart of unity when you disagree with one another. I, I would imagine that some of us are there right in this moment. There's, uh, there are people that are mad, and there are people that are sad, and there are people that are glad, and there are people that are lamenting, and there are people that are cheering, and we recognize in this moment there's going to be lots of disagreement at the table and so we want to move to a place of understanding what do I do in my heart how do I keep a spirit of unity even when we're in a place of disagreement now the phrase agree to disagree is that phrase in the English language that re resolves uh, or is based on this idea of this resolution of a conflict, and I, I love the way this is de defined, right? It's a resolution of a conflict, usually a debate or a quarrel, sounds familiar lately, whereby all parties, and I want you to circle this word, tolerate but do not accept the opposing position. Let me say that again, whereby all parties tolerate, but do not accept the opposing positions. Now, the word tolerance is so interesting to me because when you think about that, and it, it stands out to me in this definition of agree to disagree, because tolerance says this, it allows the existence, occurrence, or practice of something that one does not necessarily like or agree with without interference. The second part of that definition is accept or endure someone or something unpleasant or disliked with forbearance, which means self-control and patience. And then finally, to be capable of continued subjection to without adverse reaction. And so that's often with climate or uh, a medicine. We, get a, we build up a tolerance. And so this word in itself, when you think about the phrase agree to disagree, it's that we tolerate I'm not quite sure that's where we want to be. Now, have you ever been in a conversation where that phrase has come up? Well, all right, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. Have you ever been there? I have been there plenty of times. It has been used against me, and I have used it against others. But I have found, for me, that underneath 
what I'm really saying is I just have to tolerate you and your opinion, and in my mind, just saying my opinion, even though you're wrong. Because I don't want to be seen as intolerant, and I'll come back to that. But sometimes we can use this phrase wisely because it works to create space, like the kid president said, pause, breathe, love. And for many of us, I think that wisdom is perfect, pause, breathe, and love. But I think love is the key to this whole thing. And I might add this, that I think the Bible and Jesus call us to a higher standard than just to tolerate. I think that the appeal to biblical unity in such a moment as this is calling our hearts, our minds, and action to move from just to tolerate to love. That we are moved to tolerate, not just tolerate, but to love. That, that's so key right now. And I think, particularly in this season, in this moment, we're all there. And maybe for some, all we have the strength to do is to start with, let me just tolerate this, this, this situation. Let me just tolerate the other side for this moment. And it could be on various things. And I just want to say to you as your pastor, grace to you. If that's all you can do in that moment, that is better than the alternative. And I will tell you this, I, I don't want you to stay there, though, because I want to encourage you that on your faith journey, we're all called to begin and end our story with love. I love what Henry Nouwen once said. He wrote this, one of the main tasks of theology, which is the study of God, is to find words that do not divide but unite, that do not create conflict but unity, that do not hurt but heal. And I would just add to his great wisdom, not just to tolerate, but to love. Now, if you've been joining us in this series, we've been talking about this topic, and I, and I would encourage you to check out the previous messages and the resources that we have on these various websites, and you'll see that we've been looking at the prayer of Jesus found in John 17, which the whole idea is unity, but unity based on the foundation of love. In John 17, Jesus prays this. Check out this prayer. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. And this is an important phrase, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. And I and them, and you and me, that they may become completely one, so that the world will know that you have sent me and have, underlined this, have loved them even as you have loved me. So I really unpacked that verse in our first message. So I'd encourage you to go back to that because Jesus knew this calling to be one was all about the world understanding that he was sent as the son of God. This is so important and that the world would know that they too are loved, that our God came to this earth to demonstrate love, not tolerance. Aren't you grateful that God just doesn't tolerate you? He loves you. And I think for some in their mind, that's how they have shaped their relationship with God, that God's just getting along, forbearing with me. He's patient, and yet it's just all about him tolerating me. Beloved, he loves you so much more. He loves you and Jesus knew that for us to have unity, it would be so difficult to do without him. That's why I am not expecting the world to be the demonstration of what unity should look like. I am expecting people that are filled by the Holy Spirit to walk in the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, to walk in the unity that Christ has given us. I, I believe that we're the model of unity to the world, and we gotta get up and get going and show them that because he knew it would be hard, and without him, we couldn't do it. And without him, we will only just kind of keep sliding into tolerating one another. And God is calling us to a higher level to love one another. 
I love what uh, Cory Booker said, tolerance is becoming accustomed to injustice. Love is becoming disturbed and activated by another's adverse condition. Wow. Tolerance crosses the street. Love confronts. Tolerance builds fences. Love opens doors. Tolerance breeds indifference. Love demands engagement. Tolerance couldn't care less. Love, check it out now, always cares more. Let that just settle in for a minute. That love always cares more. Tolerance couldn't care less. So Zig Ziglar went on to say, tolerance means you pretty much let other people do whatever they want, as long as it doesn't bother you. Tolerance is a very self-centered worldview. Being tolerant means you turn your back so that you don't have to take personal risk. Wow. He goes on to say, love is the opposite. Love is when you put yourself on the line and sacrifice your self-interest for the sake of someone else. That's where I want us to be, beloved, that we need to be moving to that level of love. Brene Brown said it, I think, aptly when she said, vulnerability is not about winning. It's not about losing. It's about having the courage to show up and be seen. And what a perfect word, word for such a time as this, that we would move to be a people, not that we just tolerate and agree to disagree, but that we would move to a higher level of demonstrating to the world what it means to love. And beloved, that love is so vulnerable because it is beyond the scope of winning or losing. It's about loving. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn to 1 John 4.20, which I think just, you know, the Apostle John just lays down the gauntlet and says, this is what it is, beloved. If you're a believer in Christ, this is the life we are called to, a level of love. So put your hand on your Bible, one hand on your heart, and say this with me. Father God, open my heart to receive your word today. Holy Spirit, open my mind to receive your truth today. And Jesus, Bless my neighbor to live out your commands today. All right, well, let's make Jesus famous. 1 John 4.20 says this, those who say, I love God and, uh-oh, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. Did he just say that? That's what John said. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, uh, uh-oh, cannot love God whom they have not seen. Do, do you see the parallel of that? That this demonstration of loving others is in line with the idea of me loving God and that in this idea, this exchange, when I am not loving others, what the Apostle John is saying is that I don't fully understand God's love and I don't fully understand how he loves me. Wow. I, I love what the church father Jerome said, and whether the story is true or not, it, it seems very interesting to me, that it said that every time that John showed up to preach, he always ended with, my little children or my beloved, let us love one another. And he said that the disciples of John began to grow, grow so weary of those same words every time their pastor would preach that until finally they came up to him with enough courage and said, uh, John, there's got to be more, right? And he says, listen, it's the Lord's commandment, and if this is only done, it's enough. I love another version of this story is this, that when they confronted John about, hey, Pastor John, don't you have another message? And he said very clearly, I'll change the message as soon as you start living it. Ouch. There's no doubt in my mind that the most important theme for the Apostle John was love. The whole section in 1 John is just dominated by this phrase. Matter of fact, in just from chapter 4, verse 7 to chapter 5, verse 3, the word love is used 32 times. In this one small book, it's used 43 times. I mean, I'm thinking John is in this mindset of what it means to love. 
And you know, I want you to hear this because I think sometimes when we, we talk about love in the church or we talk about, you know, you know, us loving one another, we kind of shut down and we kind of we kind of soften it and we are like, oh, see, this whole church and Jesus thing, it's just for soft people, weak-minded people, people that like Hallmark movies, and there's no insult on that, but you know what I'm saying. It's just that idea, it's just that that's what it's about. But I want you to understand the, the transformation that happened in the Apostle John. He didn't start out with the guy who says, I love you, man. I love you, man. He didn't start that way. Jesus called him and his brother a son of thunder. Now, not the God of thunder like we know, Thor. Not that guy. Not that handsome fella. I'm talking about a son of thunder, which meant that Jesus immediately understood his temperament, his enneagram, his personality. He knew him and read his mail. Him and his brother were sons of thunder. So that's why when they were called to be disciples, his dad was like, yeah, go on, take my boys. I'm, go on, grow them up, Jesus, grow them up. And so these sons of thunder were walking with God, who is the incarnation of love. And they're walking along, and we read in their journey, there comes a point where they're feeling pretty good about themselves. They feel like they got it going on, these sons of thunder. And they come up to the city that really was not accommodating to them and to Jesus in the preaching of the gospel. And this is what the sons of thunder say, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? This doesn't sound like the ooey gooey apostle of love. John had a love problem. He was prone to anger and rudeness and being unloving. And so it took Jesus, I can't even imagine, great patience, not tolerance, but great patience and love to see John shaped into who he became which is so important because one of the most famous verses that we read in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What happened to this son of thunder? I'll tell you what happened. He walked with Jesus. And he learned that he had a problem, a love problem. He was only going to love those who loved him the same way. He was only going to love those who agreed with his message opinion he only loved those that can I just dare say it that he could tolerate until he met Jesus and realized love is bigger and better than tolerance and if I could dare say beloved or even violence we don't need to be calling down thunder and fire on cities we need to be raising up cities in a place of love that it feels like a holy fire and the whole earth is shaking because the presence of God is there. How? Through love. By the time you get to 1 John, he's, he's lost his mind. The apostle John has lost his mind. He is so wrapped up in love that a Hallmark card could be made every time he spoke. It was just love, love, love. He goes in 1 John and talks about the source of love, the inspiration of love, who, by the way, is Jesus. The practice of love, who, by the way, was modeled by Jesus. The command of love, who, by the way, was spoken by, by Jesus. The way of love being seen in and through us. I love what this says in 1 John 4 and verse 9. John goes on to say, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, uh-oh, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we must also, what? Love one another. This is so key to the idea of unity in the midst of disagreement. And I, I gotta tell you, it's not about tolerance. It's about love. I, I, I'm so convinced that love is revealed to us so that love can be revealed through us. If it was just about tolerance, then tolerance would have been revealed and that's how we would have been living, just calling down fire on people. And, and God's not calling us to do that. <laughs> He's calling to us to a place of holy love, holy fire falling on people. Because the love that was revealed to us, wow, think about the stewardship responsibility we have now, is a love that he wants to see revealed through us. One of the first Bible verses I ever memorized was found in 1 John. 
We love because he first loved us. That for me, beloved, was so clarifying of the whole gospel message, of what it meant to love enemy, what it meant to love the person that I just don't fully understand, what it meant to love the person that had such radical different opinions and lifestyles than I could even comprehend. It was this idea that I love because he first loved me. And because he loved me, and I realized that love was sent to the earth, that Jesus was sent to demonstrate love, that maybe God is doing the same demand for me, that it's my call now to love the world. Think about this, that love was sent to be revealed into us because God sent his son, and then God sent the son so that we might live and not just anywhere but through him and then God sent the son to show us what the the order the right order of love is and God sent his son to be the sacrifice for our fallenness and God sent his son so that we listen might love others not just tolerate them God is love God loves us we receive God's love God's love is born in us God's love teaches us how to love and how to love ourselves well and where we should be seeking love and God's love can be known daily and God's love can be shown daily God's love can be known daily and God's love can be shown daily It's important that we get the order right that God loves you then we realize I am loved. And then from there, we love. God loves, we are loved, and then we love. Don't get that order backwards, beloved. God loves, gives us the foundation. We are loved, that's our identity and who we are in Christ. Then from this space, the only thing we can do is love others. Not tolerate, love Wow, I, I, I know this message, it seems so simple. So like, come on, Fraser, give me something deeper. I, I gotta echo what the Apostle John says. It's like, it doesn't get any deeper than that. In this season, I don't think our nation needs to see more tolerance. It needs to see love in action through the body of Christ in a way that people see who Jesus is is what an amazing opportunity and you got to recognize beloved that in this moment the key to agreeing while disagreeing because it's going to be part of our lives again is not about tolerance it's about the love of christ that has been revealed in me and can i just say this this love costs when we're thinking about Tolerance, I think tolerance is all about kind of settling the argument and really not claiming who wins. But internally, it's like, I agree to disagree, but I'm right, and I'll just deal with you and tolerate you. Can I tell you that in this moment, love definitely wins, but love had to be lost before the victory came. Jesus actually came and lost so that we would win. He modeled to us something so deep, so powerful, and it was his message all the way through, and the Apostle John picked it up, the Apostle Paul picked it up, that I, you know, I, I can't gain anything but just who Christ is. I, I was everything but nothing compared to who Jesus is, and the Apostle John's like, I, I can't do this. I can't call down fire on people anymore. I, I gotta love them because of what Jesus did for me. He, he showed me what winning and losing looked like, what agreeing and disagreeing looked like, not through tolerance or anger or hate, but how love is demonstrated to the world through sacrifice and cost. You know, John wasn't making this up. He saw it modeled from Jesus. In John 13, Jesus said this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must, man, he's not playing. He's not just mixing words here. He's not like, I suggest that maybe if you're feeling like it and it goes your way, you know, this week, you'll love someone. He's not saying, you know, uh, depending on how, you know, this season goes or this election goes or this relationship goes or this situation goes or this circumstance goes, then, you know, contemplate whether or not you would like to love. That's not what Jesus is saying. saying, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men, all people, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love 
one another. I'll wrap up this way. One of my favorite quotes comes from the movie The Last Jedi. It's this epic moment, and I, I think I might have shared this with you before, but there's this epic moment where, you know, Rose sacrifices herself for Finn. Rose has got this silent crush on, you know, the handsome Finn, and this, this is what happens. She sacrifices, sorry, sorry, spoiler alert, that happens, and when Finn asks, why did she sacrifice herself for him? She says, because I saved you, you dummy. That, that's a whole thing on marriage and relationship and men and women understanding things that, anyways. I saved you, you dummy. And Finn asks the question, why? And I love this quote. That's how we're going to win. Not fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. Let me say that again. That's how we're going to win. Not fighting what we hate, saving what we love. That's how we're going to win. Not just tolerating and agreeing to disagree, and I'm just tolerating you, and I'll just get through it, but I, I really don't like your opinion or who you are or what you stand for. I, I'm not going to live there, beloved. I'm going to live at a higher level. We're not going to win by fighting what we hate. It's about saving what we love, our neighbors, our relationship, our nation. Man, they need to see a demonstration of love. We can agree to disagree in this season, no doubt about it, but not out of tolerance or the fear of being intolerant, which I think is a compromise of our convictions, but to demonstrate love in the midst of differences, losses, lamenting, and victories. We gotta learn how to navigate all of those four spaces with grace and humility. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter two. Make my joy complete by being the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. CCF, friends watching in, family members. Make the joy complete, being the same mind, same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. The seasons will change, elections will come and go, but Jesus will always be the center of our lives. In this moment, God is calling us to a higher level of love because the world doesn't know how to do it, but we can show them. But that's gonna take us digging deep and recognizing, God, I can't do this without you because I'm always gonna face a different opinion. I'm always gonna face someone that doesn't agree with my ideas or my thoughts or my person I'm going to need to learn how to see everything through your eyes. And God, when I see through your eyes, I see that you love. I see that when you were on the cross, you loved. You loved your mother. You loved the disciples. You even loved the people that were crucifying you. I, I, I can't even understand an inkling of what that means to love like that. But Lord, that's what I want in my life. That's what I want for the body of Christ. And that's what I want the world to see, that in this moment, when we don't agree, when one side is winning and the other side is not, either way, he's still king. He's still worthy of my love. And you're worthy of receiving that love. I hope today that that's your decision, that you're gonna move forward, you're gonna move into a new level of how you're gonna express love in this moment, whatever, wherever, whatever, however side you're on, whatever you're experiencing right now, that God would move you and encourage you to a new level that the world would see so clearly that man, it's not about what we're hating, it's about who we're loving. And I can't wait to see how God's gonna use you in this moment to show the world what unity is, because when you do that, then the world will see that fa the Father and Jesus are one. And when they see that and know that he's the Son of God, then they will know they are loved by God for all eternity. That's what we choose to receive. Several years ago, a couple years ago, it feels like a long time in these last nine months. Everything before nine months seems like ages ago. I did a series called Already Loved. And in that series, we ended every message with this proclamation and declaration. And I'd like for us to close our time by just sharing the same phrase, these same words, because I think it speaks for this moment. 
So they'll be on the screen. I'll read them along. And then you'll see a couple blank spaces where you have to fill in your name and you have to name that situation, circumstance, person, opposition, opposing idea. And when you do that, we'll continue on and we'll believe what God's going to do. So I'll give you an example. I, Fraser, am going to love you, Boston Celtics. That was painful for me. But in lightness, I realized that section right there, there are things and there are situations and there are ideologies that I could put in that name slot that I, it's much deeper than my rivalry on, on the NBA, that I realize that I'm going to love you. And you, then you continue on and say, no matter where you are, what you've done, or how you look, feel, or behave, I'm going to love you. I will choose to love you in a way that honors God and self. I am committed to learning how to love in all things. I will try daily not to let you suffer physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually by my life so that I am an example of love. I will seek to love you in your daily circumstances rather than criticize and be selfish. If you feel unloved, I will seek to lift you up in Christ's love. Why? Because love never stops loving. So I will contend for love until it's a present tense reality in your life. I love you. And that's what love means to me. May the grace of Christ, may the beauty of his love, may the hope that is found in the Savior of the world unite your hearts to move beyond tolerance, to recognize that we will have to in some places agree to disagree, but not because I'm tolerating, because I love you. I love you enough to hear your side. I love you enough to recognize that we still have to walk this path out again. And I I love you enough to say in this moment, Jesus is bigger than all situations and circumstances and that we can unite towards. So God, let my mouth, my hands, my heart, and my feet be a demonstration to love, to not walk away, but to engage in this season and all the seasons of our life. Go in that peace, knowing that you're loved. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, CCF. I love you. I'm so grateful for you. And I am grateful for the season that we're about to enter into together because God is good, so very good. God bless you guys.